If you look at the demographics of the North Country, it is a predominantly white place. Census data shows that 88% of residents identify as Caucasian. That can make growing up here as a person of color really difficult. But we don't hear those stories very often. Today, one woman who grew up in a small mining town in the Champlain Valley and felt like an outsider in her own hometown. Her story on today's story of the day. Support for Story of the Day comes from Pearsall Wealth Management at UBS Wealth Management USA, subsidiary UBS AG, member FINRA SIPC, 1 Broad Street, Glens Falls. Hey, I'm David Summerstein. It's Monday, October 30th. First up, big freighters are moving again on the St. Lawrence River. Canadian St. Lawrence Seaway workers are back on the job after their union reached a tentative agreement over the weekend. Catherine Wheeler reports. The week-long strike shut down the vital shipping waterway that connects the Atlantic Ocean with the Upper Great Lakes. The ships on the seaway carry cargo like fuel and grain. A long strike could have had a major impact on both the U.S. and Canada. The union that represents the seaway workers said in a statement that they won't be releasing any details about the tentative agreement until it's been shared with workers and ratified. A vote will be scheduled in the coming days. Workers were looking for higher wages in their new contract. The St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation says it will begin passing ships today. Catherine Wheeler, North Country Public Radio. Communities around the North Country are celebrating Halloween tomorrow with some special events. The Aviation Mall in Queensbury is having a haunted house from 11 to 7. In Watertown, the Salmon Run Mall will host trick-or-treaters from 6 to 7 in the evening. In the central Adirondacks, Lake Placid is putting on its annual Halloween parade downtown starting at noon. After that, local businesses will hand out candy until 5 o'clock. Saranac Lake and Tupper Lake are also hosting downtown trick-or-treating events. The one in Saranac Lake is from 3 to 5, while Tupper's is a little more in the evening from 7 to 9 tomorrow night. Happy Halloween! There's a reason the North Country is so overwhelmingly white, and it's not just an accident of history. Tomorrow, we'll hear about the Ku Klux Klan's presence in the North Country and how it made the region whiter than it otherwise would have been. But today, let's meet Alice Green. She's a black woman who grew up in the 1950s and 60s in a small mining town on Lake Champlain. Amy Feireisel has her story. Today, Alice Green is a lifelong activist and academic. She has a doctorate in criminal justice and has worked with Albany's police department on equity and diversity issues. But in 1948, Green was just seven years old and had just moved to the North Country with her parents and five siblings. Her father had found a job with Republic Steel, working in a blasting furnace. Green says they moved largely as a way to escape the Deep South. Because of Jim Crow segregation, and also the criminal justice system itself. The Witherby Sherman mine was one of the largest pre-war producers of iron ore in the country. Its hub was Port Henry, and there was actually a black community there, about 13 families living in company housing, all on the same street. Elizabeth Street in Port Henry is where everybody lived. They developed this community. They even established a church. But that housing was full when Green's father was hired, and they got housing in Witherby, a small town five miles away. It was full of other mine workers, many first-generation immigrants from Europe. The Greens were one of two black families there. The town was totally white. It was almost totally Catholic. And for us, (laughs) who, who were neither, it was extremely challenging. Green says there were other black people scattered around the North Country, cooks in Lake Placid, military men in Plattsburgh, apple pickers in Peru, but they rarely saw them. Green says her family always felt like outsiders in Witherby. Green's new memoir is called Outsider. She was inspired to write it after attending a high school reunion. She says former classmates waxed poetic about how when they'd grown up, racial tensions didn't exist. Green was floored. That hadn't been the story of her Adirondack childhood, which she says was full of subtle racism. They don't come to your house and, you know, burn crosses and things like that. It was also blatant racism. 
She almost never felt welcome, kids didn't invite her to birthday parties, and racist language was everywhere, even in schoolyard games. And it was eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch the nigger by his toe. That was so accepted. Everywhere I went, I mean, it's not only kids, but adults. They repeated that over and over again. Nearly a century after the Civil War, Green says life was far from equal. She saw that the summer she was 15 years old, when she and one of her few friends, a next-door neighbor named Myrtle, both got their working papers and found summer jobs as chambermaids down near Paradox Lake. We were just so excited. We thought we would go and work and be roommates. They got a ride down to Paradox and met the owner, Mrs. Claudis. Mrs. Claudis and her family lived in this big, gorgeous apartment. Mrs. Claudis gestured to Green's friend. She said, Myrtle, you're going to stay here. Then she took young Alice to the backyard, where there was an old barn. She said, this is where you will live. And that was totally confusing to me, because when I walked in, there was nothing there except a cot. Green learned that other adult black workers also stayed in the barn, but they worked nights, so Green was left alone. I would be the only one up in this barn and didn't understand the separation thing quite. It was dark. I, did, I was 40 miles from my home, and I could hear my mother saying, stay there. You know, you need to make money. But something else told me <laughs> that this wasn't right. She got up as soon as it was light and asked to speak with Mrs. Claudis. I told her, I don't understand why the black people are living in the barn. And that there are bats there and I want to live with my, with my friend. And she said, you can't do that. Green quit on the spot. Her friend Myrtle had heard it all. And she said, well, I quit too. <laughs> so the two of us <laughs> gathered our thing. We had no idea how we were going to get home. None whatsoever. But Green said that didn't matter to her. And she points to that moment as when she learned how to do the right thing, even if it was hard. I never regretted it. I, didn't, you know, I couldn't get another job. I had to use my old clothes and all that stuff. But I felt good about myself. And that's where a lot of what I do comes from. Green went to college at SUNY Albany and got her master's in education. After working as a teacher and doing community work in low-income neighborhoods, she got two more masters in social work and criminology, then a doctorate in criminal justice. She says most of her education was motivated by a desire to help incarcerated people. She says there have been lots of hard moments in her career, but she's never shied away from them. I have to confront people, and I can confront anybody. You know, people in power doesn't bother me what's ever. <laughs> as long as I think that I'm doing the right thing. In 1985, Green founded the Center for Law and Justice in Albany, a nonprofit that works to aid incarcerated people and keep new people from entering prisons. She still visits the Adirondacks regularly and has a place in Essex with her husband, which is where we spoke. She says she loves introducing people to the area and enjoying it herself. And to go places where I wouldn't think I could be uh, when I was growing up. I mean, the message that we got was, that's not for you. In Lake Placid especially. <laughs> now, I come back to enjoy what was off limits to me. <laughs> when people ask Green where she's from, she tells them, the Adirondacks. Amy Fireisel, North Country Public Radio, on the shores of Lake Champlain. Green's recently released memoir is titled Outsider, Stories of Growing Up Black in the Adirondacks. She previously published a book about her working life, prisons, and civil rights. It's titled We Who Believe in Freedom. You can find links to both books in the online story on our website at ncpr.org. We have more news there all the time, of course, ncpr.org. Music today by Eddie Lawrence of Moira and Evan Veenstra of Gananoque, Ontario. I'm David Summerstein, North Country Public Radio.